In the Metro universe, leaving the relative safety of the underground tunnel system is fraught with risk. Venturing to the surface exposes you to radiation, not to mention the wild mutated creatures that can attack from every corner, or even swoop down from the air and carry you away in their giant talons. The only people crazy enough to go to the surface are specialist stalkers and even they don't venture too far from metro stations. Leaving Moscow itself was the stuff of dreams and that's for those who at least know what the surface looks like in order to dream about it. Many have spent all their lives underground and can't dream of something they can't comprehend. Artyom however is a dreamer. He has a relatively good life in the Vidinyenka metro station where he's married to Anya and ready to raise a family. Given what he's already been through, no one would begrudge him taking things easy and living a quiet but dull life full of mushrooms and vodka. However, that's not enough for Artyom. He still remembers life before the war and is desperate to leave the metro, and even Moscow entirely to live where the air isn't thick with radiation. Doing this requires taking a huge risk for the potential of a huge reward. The developers at 4A Games are also dreamers. As with Artyom, 4A Games could have taken the safe and easy route by sticking to the metro setting that had served it so well in the previous games. No one would have minded, especially when you consider the awful conditions under which 4A Games made those first two games in Kiev, Ukraine. I wouldn't have begrudged 4A Games chilling out in its new office in Malta and making a relatively safe sequel. But 4A Games is full of ambitious developers who wouldn't settle for producing another game in the same underground locations we've seen twice before already. These are the same developers who worked minor miracles to create phenomenal looking games while practically sitting on top of each other, having to sneak computer equipment past customs and dealing with regular power cuts. Of course they aren't going to just make another one of those. And so, like Artyom, 4A Games took a big risk and decided to move events outside of the metro tunnels that had already served them so well. Metro Exodus contains a couple of mini open worlds to explore and as a result that suffocating sense of claustrophobia that was so instrumental to the first two games is rarely seen or felt. Why be safe when you can take risks and possibly achieve greatness? High risk, high reward. Unfortunately I don't think the risk quite paid off. It's not that these quasi open world spaces can't work in a game series like Metro, we're talking about the people who made the Stalker games after all. In fact open worlds are pretty much the default style for games with a heavy focus on survival over all out action. And credit where it's due, 4A games got a lot of things right in the transition to larger play spaces. There aren't waypoints everywhere, there's a sensible amount of resource gathering so you don't have to pick up every untrampled blade of grass you come across, and the use of multiple mini open world areas means the story still has direction and a good ending to cap it all off. But then there's the things that don't quite work, such as the stifled and awkward movement that makes moving around the world a chore, or the fitting but never less boring use of bandit camps to add content to the world, and the mutated beasts that still don't look at all natural, which is even more obvious than it used to be because you can watch them casually from a distance instead of being jumped on in dark tunnels. None of this is to say that Metro Exodus is a bad game. If you want the quick summary, I'm giving Metro Exodus 4 stars out of 5 because it's still really good, and either on par with Last Light or slightly inferior. Exodus is longer and much of that extra time is unrewarding, leaving the whole thing feeling a little bloated. There's a short written review on my website which is linked in the description. Check that out if you want my spoiler free thoughts because this video is full of spoilers. I'll talk more about difficulty options later, but for now I just want to note that most discussion in this video is centred around my original Ranger Hardcore playthrough, and most of the footage is from that run. If you see crosshairs then the footage is from a second run where I experimented with all the other difficulty levels. I've already published videos on Metro 2033 and Metro Last Light and they go into a fair bit of detail surrounding the making of those games. There was a lot to talk about for those ones, most of it fairly depressing, although there was a happy ending to the story, with 4A Games opening a new studio in Malta in 2014 and expanding the team to around 80 people. Metro Exodus's development seems relatively straightforward by comparison, with one notable exception being the stroke suffered by the creative director and co-founder of the studio Andrew Prokhorov in 2018. He returned to work at the end of the same year and I'm sure his absence was felt considering how many key decisions need to be made in the year leading up to release. On a more positive note, it did mean Prokhorov was able to experience one of his games like a player instead of a developer. Working on beta version, uh, I received stroke and uh, team finishing the game without me. So playing the, the game, I am really proud that uh, I worry about that now. Perfect. I'm worried about that now. So, uh, guys did it perfect. In June 2015, between the release of Last Light and Exodus, Dmitry Glukovsky, the author of Metro 2033 and Metro 2034, released the third main book in the series, Metro 2035. 
The Metro games have a complex relationship with the books that inspired the series. None of the games are direct adaptions of the books, however Metro 2033 the game comes closest to the book version. 4A games changed a lot of the moment to moment events but very much kept the gist of it in place. Metro 2033 the game is still about Artyom's journey from one metro station to another as he attempts to warn Polis about the threat of the Dark Ones, before eventually climbing a tower and helping initiate a missile strike that wipes them out. Metro 2033 focuses more on the four factions, particularly the Reds and Nazis, with fewer cultist groups that took up time in the books. That's why it doesn't feel like an adaption as such, even though it is fairly similar and has much the same conclusion, at least if you look at the game's bad ending. With Metro Last Light, 4A games didn't have a book to work from. There is a Metro 2034 novel, however it focuses on Hunter's exploits and Artyom doesn't feature. Glukowski worked with 4A games on Last Light to write a story about a war between the factions who were fighting for control of supplies in D6, with a subplot involving the Dark Ones. We discovered that the Dark Ones were not extinct after all, and in the good ending they saved Artyom's life. With Glukowski having worked on Metro Last Light, you could be forgiven for hoping that the Metro 2035 novel would keep things consistent with Last Light to keep the canon similar between the novels and the games. That doesn't quite happen. Metro 2035 borrows elements from Metro Last Light, specifically the terrible faction war and the attack on the theatre station, plus the Nazis killing babies that they consider to be freaks. However, intertwined with all that is another major story thread about Artyom trying to find evidence of life surviving outside Moscow. Following an eventful journey that includes spending time in a concentration camp, Artyom uncovers a huge conspiracy. There are other survivors out there. Not only that, but the war is still going on. A group called the Invisible Watchers set up a bunch of frequency jammers stopping any signals from Moscow reaching the outside world and vice versa. This was supposedly done on the order of the surviving Russian government in order to keep Moscow safe from further attacks. The theory being that if NATO thought Moscow was wiped out, it would direct its efforts elsewhere. The story of Metro Exodus borrows a lot from this part of Metro 2035, however these stories feel remarkably different mainly due to Artyom's relationships with others in the book versus the games. In the book, Anya is furious with Artyom for taking so many trips up to the surface. He constantly puts himself at risk and needs regular blood transfusions due to all the radiation. Likely as a result of this radiation exposure and the mental strain Artyom's putting himself under, he can't get an erection and even if he does, Anya's worried that they'll have mutant babies due to his irradiated sperm. And then there's Miller who is a complete arsehole in the books, going as far as to give an execution order on Artyom if he discovers that Miller is working for the Reds. Miller is still harsh on Artyom in the games as you might expect of a military general whose daughter you happen to be married to, but most of it comes from a good place, mostly. In the books Miller is in a wheelchair, however in Exodus he has prosthetic limbs to replace those he lost in the battle for D6. Metro 2035 ends with Artyom and Anya leaving the Metro system to find a new life elsewhere. In Metro Exodus, Artyom and Anya uncover the conspiracy incredibly quickly and most of the game is spent outside the Metro system. Right at the start Artyom heads above ground with Anya into Hansa restricted territory on a hunt for a radio signal from the outside world. Artyom is convinced he's heard signals from elsewhere, but no one else believes him. Artyom doesn't pick up any signal on this occasion, but on the way back home a fully functioning train happens to roll on past. Anya and Artyom barely have time to process what they've just seen when they are picked up by a Hansa patrol unit along with an old woman and a young man from outside Moscow, who were trying to get into the city to look for the boy's father. They are proof of life outside the Moscow metro system. Artyom was right all along. The Hansa unit recognises Anya as the daughter of Colonel Miller and it's a good job they did because they are under orders to execute everyone they find to maintain the secret of life outside Moscow. This includes the old woman and boy. Artyom tries to save them from execution but fails. They're killed and Artyom is shot and left for dead with Anya taken captive. Fortunately for Artyom the bullet hit the dog tags Hunter gave him back in Metro 2033 so he survives, rescues Anya and is about to escape on a train when he's knocked unconscious. The squad that recaptured Artyom and Anya is none other than a joint unit of Hansa and Spartan soldiers, led by Miller who was let in on the big secret about life outside Moscow around 6 months ago. As in the novel, Moscow is being blanketed by signal jammers to prevent NATO forces targeting the capital. The Hansa troops state that Artyom and Anya must be killed because they know too much. Miller is all for enforcement of the law but he draws the line when it comes to his own daughter. The Hansa troops are thrown off the train and the small group heads off as fugitives. This all happens in a couple of hours. 
According to developer diaries that are scattered around the world in New Game Plus, the original story for Exodus would have been closer to the Metro 2035 novel, with the group not leaving the Metro until much nearer the end of the game. There was also an idea for around 100 people to be on the train out of Moscow, so it would have been more like a group of settlers looking to start a new colony somewhere. 4A Games eventually settled on leaving the Metro earlier and keeping the group small so that the player could get to know the companions during the journey. In both cases I think 4A Games made the right decision, although the big reveal about life outside Moscow and escaping on the train could have happened a bit later. It all feels incredibly rushed as if 4A Games just wanted to get it out of the way. Conversely, the rest of Exodus is fairly slow paced, in particular the first open world section of Volga. There are two main open world sections, Volga and the Caspian, and two other maps that are large but not really open worlds. The story takes place over roughly a year, with each map being themed around the relevant season. Volga is winter, Caspian is summer, Taiga is autumn, and the dead city is winter again. We spent spring inside a large bunker trying to escape a bunch of cannibals. The introduction of open worlds isn't a resounding success, but it's not a complete failure either. Let's start with some of the positives. Firstly, the heavy survival element works well in a large space. Instead of exploring every corner for much needed resources, you're wandering towards every abandoned shack and vehicle you see. This gives a little more scope for environmental storytelling. There's only so much you can do with dead bodies in metro tunnels after all. The bigger play space also lets you wander at your own pace and, dare I say it, makes for a great immersive experience. In my video on Metro 2033 I spent a fair bit of time talking about how immersive the game was, even though I'm not a huge fan of that word because it's often used incorrectly. I loved all the little features like manually changing your air filters, wiping your gas mask clean, and even charging up your flashlight. None of these individual parts sound special, but as a whole they contributed to one of the most immersive games I'd ever played. Metro Exodus maintains all that great stuff and adds a bunch more. I really don't believe immersion is the be all and end all of great video game experiences, and there's a difference between immersion and realism, but when it's done this well, it's absolutely sublime. RTM now has a map that you open in real time to help you get around the larger levels, although don't expect it to be full of waypoint markers. There will only ever be a handful of markers on the map at any given time, and they are the result of your companions specifically pointing out locations of interest. Typically, Miller gives you the location of the main quest, and then other companions will suggest you go and recover something, such as a guitar being butchered by a group of bandits or a teddy bear held hostage by a newborn demon. Yes, it's essentially a bunch of fetch quests and kill all the bandit missions, but because they are so few and far between, it's not a huge problem. My main gripe here is that when you clear out a bunch of bandits, they return shortly after as if nothing happened, leading to your actions feeling a little meaningless, like a live service game or something. You can now craft basic items like medkits and filters, and even change weapon attachments while out in the field, although again, this is all in real time. If you want to craft more ammo, you'll need to find special crafting benches which are often located next to beds if you want to rest up for a bit. You have binoculars to explore the environment, and night vision goggles can be equipped for those darker moments. Your weapons get dirtier the longer you use them, especially in extreme weather conditions like rain or sandstorms. Dirty weapons are more likely to jam, so every now and again you need to clean them. It's quick and doesn't need to be done all that often, but it's another little feature that fits the world perfectly. Exodus includes a lot of features that would be a chore in other games, but 4A Games manages to keep on just the right side of the tedium line with this stuff. Metro Exodus never wants to take you out of the moment, and for the most part it succeeds. The new system of resource gathering doesn't break immersion or anything drastic, however when combined with the ability to craft gear on the fly it does detract somewhat from the difficulty. The currency of choice in the previous Metro games was the special bullets that served as both a more powerful type of ammo and a currency. Obviously currencies are only valuable to the extent they're accepted as such by those selling goods, and now that we're out of the Metro system there isn't much call for these special bullets, and even if there was you don't exactly meet a lot of friendly traders on your travels. Instead of bullets you collect metal scrap and chemicals which you use to craft bullets, medkits, air filters and even grenades. The bullet system in the previous games was excellent, especially when you had to literally shoot money at enemies because you were stuck in a desperate situation. Resource gathering in Exodus doesn't quite generate that level of excitement. You can't craft ammo from your backpack with the exception of pellets, so you will find ammo in the field on dead bodies and in the occasional ammo stash. However, medkits, filters, knives and grenades are incredibly rare, or at least they were on Ranger Hardcore difficulty. When you consider how the crafting system works this makes complete sense. If you can craft an item wherever you like, it doesn't need to be lying around for you to pick up. In the world of Metro, it doesn't make a lot of sense for medkits and grenades to be lying around in the open. That stuff would have been scavenged a long time ago. 
While all this makes sense, it doesn't necessarily mean it's an improvement on what came before, and in this case it often leads to a lack of tension. There are always so many resources around that you don't need to worry about a shortage of medkits and filters, you don't even need to go far out of your way to collect resources. So long as you pick up what is lying around nearby, you'll probably have enough scrap and chemicals to craft whatever you need. It used to feel immensely satisfying to find a med kit tucked away in a locker in a side room, but now you just walk around hammering the pickup button as you play and at some point you'll have enough to craft a new med kit. Air filters are rarely an issue at all. With the exception of high radiation zones dotted around the map, you don't usually need a filter above ground, although underground you likely will. This is the complete opposite of the previous two games where you generally needed a mast to go above ground and were safe in the tunnels. Given that most of Exodus is spent out in the open, you won't need to worry too much about filters. I nearly got caught short at one point around three quarters of the way through and that was it. A Metro game where you don't spend your entire time worrying about where the next breath of air is coming from is a Metro game that's missing something. That's not to say 4A games made a bad decision by introducing this crafting system or letting players craft certain gear on the fly, but there might have been a better way to implement it. One thing that springs to mind is having more resource types, so that basic metal for new pellets can be common, as can chemicals for cleaning your guns, but extra resources needed for med kits and air filters could be much rarer. One change I really like is removing the ability to purchase or craft weapon and armour mods. Instead this incredibly valuable gear has to be found by exploring the map via side quests, or by dismantling enemy weapons. Attacking an enemy camp and finding a helmet that helps protect against headshots or a belt that lets you carry more equipment is far more satisfying than any consumable items like medkits or air filters. These mods are especially valuable now that you can change gear on the go. For example, in the previous games I never used to equip thermal scopes unless I knew for certain I would be in the dark until the next time I got the chance to change up my gear. That was rare and with the thermal scopes being useless in any lit condition they barely got used. Now you can make the deliberate choice to go out at night with thermal scopes equipped, and if you're out long enough that the sun rises or you simply enter a lit area, you can take them off. The decision on whether to go out during the day or at night isn't an insignificant one. During the day there are a lot more human enemies around and you're easier to spot. At night you have the obvious cover of darkness, however you also have to contend with more wild beasts, plus these weird electrical anomalies that drift around all over the place. These anomalies aren't really explained and are barely commented on which is a shame. They can be pretty deadly if you get too close. One of the developer diaries reveals that in an early build the human enemies would attack the anomalies seeing them as a threat, which would then bring out the beasts who responded to the noise. The electrical anomalies would then kill man and beast, leaving the environment littered with dead bodies. 4A games figured that while cool to see once it would lead to a fairly boring experience, and so it moved the human enemies far enough away from the anomalies that they didn't get involved. Changing up the scopes is only a fraction of what you can do with the guns. You can make so many changes to each weapon that they become almost unrecognisable. You can change the grip, barrel, scope, magazines and add lasers and pointers if you like. The Takar that you get near the start can morph into a phenomenally deadly railgun by the end of the game. A tiny handgun with a three bullet magazine that packs a loud punch can be changed into something closer to a sniper rifle with a suppressor, 4x scope and a couple of extensions. New attachments can be pulled from enemy weapons and the best ones are often related to side quests. If you want a decent scope to turn your assault rifle into a sniper's wet dream, you should consider dealing with that deadly sniper, Anya points out, and then stripping his weapon. Best of all, you can see every mod reflected in the gun you're holding. Changing a reflex sight for a large night vision scope is fairly obvious, but you can also see every change to the barrel, handle and magazine size. You can often see how many bullets are in a magazine, so if you change the magazine size you'll see a corresponding increase in the number of bullets being fed into the gun. You can even see the weapons gradually getting dirtier. The details of gun models are often lost on me. I'm not a gun fanatic by any means, and in most games I don't know the names of the guns I'm using. That's not the case in Metro Exodus, where I always know what base gun I have. On starting New Game Plus I quickly sought out not only my favourite guns, but also my favourite attachments. They all sound, feel and look distinct. 4A Games puts a lot of effort into its weapons and it 100% pays off. On Ranger Hardcore there aren't many opportunities to go all out with the guns, but when you do you can really feel how much the gunplay has improved from Metro 2033. When fighting off the cannibals there's no way to remain hidden and the enemies run at you practically begging to be shot. I happily obliged. A rock soundtrack kicks in during the fight and the whole thing is glorious. It isn't difficult and I don't think it's supposed to be, it's a rare moment for you to let your hair down and just go nuts. Ah, 
Unfortunately, the music isn't used to this effect anywhere else. There are a couple of moments where the music threatens to break through, but it's always held back just a little too much for my tastes. Despite the lack of music, sound effects are generally excellent with the exception of putting out fires, which for some reason sound like someone trying to use a battery powered chainsaw that's low on juice. Many of my criticisms of the larger maps in Exodus are issues from the previous games which get amplified when playing in a semi-open world. While the Metro games have always looked great, stunning in fact, the movement of beasts such as the Watchmen, Nosalis and Shrimp has always looked iffy at best. Beasts move awkwardly, often not properly interacting with the environment and generally flopping around when shot at. I commented on this in previous videos because it looked shoddy and the hitboxes fell off, but that was with fights in confined and dark areas, with fights happening at a frantic pace. We're out in the open now, often during the middle of the day, and those terrible enemy movements can now be examined in close detail even through binoculars. The beasts feel like they're from a different game. Whereas the rest of the world benefits from meticulous attention to detail, the beasts often act like dumb enemies of the type you get in cheap asset flips. They also don't chase you for very long, so if they do see you, you can just run away for a bit and escape. This was fitting when running away meant turning lots of corners and going through doors, but it's a bit silly when you escape while still in their eyeline. It's like their AI hasn't been adjusted for the new setting. Another existing flaw brought forward into Exodus is Artyom's awkward movement, which was a minor annoyance in the previous games when the most athletic thing he did was climb a clearly marked ledge, and quite another when you're presented with buildings and structures that you can approach from a variety of angles without having a clue what you can and cannot climb. You're best off assuming you can't climb or traverse anything that isn't flat or clearly marked with a path. Random rocks or slightly too steep climbs are a no-go, and you generally can't climb on top of obstacles like shelves and boxes except when you can. Games with limited climbing abilities typically use some sort of colour coding to let the player know what they can and can't climb, but Exodus doesn't do this, probably in an effort to keep up the realism. I found the lack of mobility incredibly frustrating and largely stopped trying to climb stuff unless it was part of a stealth path, in which case you can kind of intuit that you're supposed to climb on a particular obstacle. I always like to take a stealth approach where possible, but far too often I felt like the best paths were unavailable due to arbitrary blocks on what I could and couldn't climb. When you do climb, the animation is awkward and often bears little relation to what Artyom is actually climbing. He'll sometimes go through lengthy animations to climb a ledge that's barely a foot high, and he climbs on top of tree stumps that I'm amazed you can climb on at all actually, in the same way he climbs up large ledges. Oh, and he can only sprint for a few seconds at a time, which makes getting around the map pretty tedious. I'll let him off that one. He's carrying a lot of gear, and the air isn't exactly good for your lungs. While on the topic of movement, there are a lot of weird sections that require you to hold down the interact button for a few seconds to squeeze through or under gaps. These took me out of the experience a bit, especially when they're used in stealth sections. If you're trying to sneak past the enemy and have to squeeze up against the wall to continue, you can basically guarantee you're safe for a few seconds. You know you're not going to get caught, so all the tension completely disappears. The last problem exasperated by the open world is the checkpoint and save system. Again, I've had my issues with this before. There was no quick save feature in previous games and checkpoints were sporadic sometimes coming in quick succession and at other times requiring you to move through multiple areas before triggering. The checkpoints sometimes happened at awful moments, such as when the game saved just before I got hit by a grenade. On restarts, the only way to avoid this was to move while the load screen was still up because the game actually started again before you could see it. There was also only one save file, so you couldn't run separate playthroughs simultaneously. And finally, if you did get trapped in an unwinnable situation, such as a lack of air filters, you had to restart the entire chapter. All those issues are present in Exodus, and even more irritating. I should point out that there is a quick save feature in all the difficulties except the Ranger Hardcore mode, and checkpointing is more frequent on the lower difficulties, so I'm mainly talking about my experience on Ranger Hardcore here. My issue isn't strictly a lack of checkpoints, it's where they're placed. For example, one early mission required me to walk to the south end of the map before sneaking past a lot of enemies and stealing a tugboat. By itself, this is a really good section. You have support if you need it, but it's much more satisfying to stay undetected, and it's perfectly possible to do so once you have a vague idea of what you're doing. Of course, first time around, you likely won't. Your companions are dotted all over the place, and it isn't completely clear where you should start, so there might be a few deaths. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, I don't mind getting it wrong a couple of times and restarting. Except in this case, after dying, you have to walk all the way back here from the base. 
it's a slow, tedious and completely unnecessary process. Why not have the save point be closer to where the mission starts? I initially placed the blame for this on the open world setting and the game not knowing when to trigger saves. After all, it's much easier to place checkpoints when you know what direction a player will approach from. I experimented by approaching this building from different directions, but it didn't trigger any saves. This sort of thing wasn't a one-off either. I had to repeat one slow boat trip about four times, because if you get hit by one projectile attack you die and there's no easy way to dodge them. On the lower difficulties there are a lot more checkpoints, which suggests the lack of checkpoints is a deliberate decision to make Ranger Hardcore mode more challenging. But even then I'm not sure. There's no quick save option on Ranger Hardcore, which means if the game were to save in a bad place, the only option would be to restart the entire chapter, which could be around 5 hours long. On Ranger Hardcore, where one shot can kill you, you don't want to get stuck in an impossible situation thanks to a bad checkpoint. You'd blame the game and you'd be perfectly right to do so. I think 4A games played it safe and tried to limit the checkpoints to areas where you'll never be in danger, even if that then means you have to do a lot of trekking back and forth when you die. I don't think it's a coincidence that the one time I did get stuck in an almost unwinnable situation due to a checkpoint was in a place where combat started right after a cutscene and there was no other place to have the save point. In fact, the circumstances were quite similar to an issue I had in Metro 2033, where I had to start moving before the game had loaded in to escape a grenade that was already on its way. Sometimes I couldn't move at all due to some invisible barrier that blocked my way. The lack of checkpoints is made all the more frustrating by how common and nonsensical the checkpoints can be in other situations, even on Ranger Hardcore mode. It wasn't uncommon for a save to trigger when entering a room with nothing in it and then save again just before leaving. I once died while trying to stealth my way through one section, only to be put back to a checkpoint that was before a horde of mutants who had attacked in a previous area. After this attack you have to crawl through what could be a loading zone before reaching a clearly distinct new area. So why not put a checkpoint right before the stealth section to save us fighting the mutants again and making our way back here? If it's part of a desire to minimise checkpoints overall, why is there a checkpoint halfway through this small area, and another one shortly after? As a more minor annoyance, it's not uncommon to get a checkpoint right before you're about to use a crafting bench, which means if you die before reaching the next save point you'll need to repeat the process of crafting bullets, changing up your weapons and attachments, and cleaning your gear. If you do get stuck in a completely unwinnable situation, which very nearly happened with me, your only choice is to completely restart the chapter as with previous games. Unlike 2033 and Last Light, some of the chapters in Exodus are absolutely huge. I spent nearly 5 hours in one and 4 in another. I pity anyone who gets an unfortunate checkpoint and loses hours of gameplay, just because 4A Games is strangely reluctant to offer multiple save files. I came so close to losing hours of my own game time. I undertook a side quest to kill a sniper, but when you reach the top of his nest after this mission a bunch of enemies attack and most of them are kitted out with their own sniper rifles. I couldn't for the life of me find a good location to take them out from afar without getting hit myself, and if I tried to zipline towards them I got killed in seconds. There's another zipline to escape on, however I even found myself taking damage while on the zipline and was then killed shortly after landing by a shot that I think went through a tree. This section had me really worried, it seemed that no matter what I did I got killed. In the end I kept trying the zipline until I got through damage free and moved slightly further away which made them all despawn. I then had to run all the way back to get the car. The system of saves, checkpoints and quick saves wouldn't usually be worth so much time in a video. You might well argue it isn't here either given that it's unlikely to be a huge problem for many people and you do kind of opt into it a bit with the Ranger Hardcore difficulty. However I can genuinely say that if I could change one thing about the series it would be its attitude towards saving and it's particularly important for Exodus given how long the chapters are. Performance is also a little rougher in the open world maps, which is perhaps to be expected. My frame rate was typically between 60 and 100, but certain sections of the maps, especially at night, would see me playing for extended periods in the mid 40s. This was nearly always while driving around and not in combat, so it didn't have a huge effect on the gameplay. It was just a bit distracting. There were a few times when things became a slideshow during cutscenes, especially when transitioning between gameplay and scripted events. Moving to new locations and autosaves also caused a few frame rate issues. I'm playing with 16 gigs of RAM, a 1080 and an i7. I started playing at 1440p on ultra but turned the settings down to 1080p on high, and the frame rate didn't get any better. Conversely, on extreme settings I didn't notice it running much worse. There was no CPU bottlenecks, I'm not sure what caused the problems. Then there is more minor stuff like textures not popping in until late, assets floating in midair, and at one point a gun that just wouldn't stop firing. Such a waste of bullets. Okay. 
A more annoying bug was when the map markers didn't get updated properly, leading me to completely the wrong place. At one point I went past an enemy camp and was going to continue into the next area when I noticed my compass pointing behind me. Given the mission goal, I assumed I was supposed to go back and rescue Alyosha, but he wasn't there. After much exploration, it turned out that the map marker just hadn't updated properly. This happened in the Caspian as well, where the game insisted I was supposed to go to one end of the map, whereas I actually needed to go to the other. Given the size of the map, this was a huge pain in the ass. So yeah, all in all, 4A games experienced a fair few teething problems with the Leap 2 larger maps, but there's more than enough here to work as a foundation for another sequel if there is to be one. If 4A Games wants to try again, I hope it looks to the Tiger map for inspiration. Tiger is the autumn setting that isn't really open. It's a large map and you have flexibility to achieve your goals, but ultimately you start at one end and finish at the other. Tiger doesn't suffer the same problems that Plague, Volga and the Caspian. I didn't have any performance issues for a start. You're always moving in one general direction, which means you don't end up meandering and wasting time. Checkpoints are better because the game knows vaguely what you're trying to do. Best of all, none of this hampers the freedom of approach offered in the two larger maps. It just means there isn't quite so much empty space between all the action. You can tackle this level in vastly different ways, and you can even skip entire camps if you want. I felt certain the map marker had broken again because I skipped an entire village without coming close to engaging any enemies. It felt wrong, so I explored further and found a couple of other routes I could have taken, but didn't. Even after taking into account a few wrong turns, this map still moved along at a much faster pace, and there was more urgency to the whole thing. You go from one encounter to the next without having to trek back to base to get a new assignment or wander across the map for the next quest. Even though Tiger is smaller than Volga and the Caspian, it's still large enough that you have to work a little harder to find the secret stealth routes when compared to the previous games. You have a choice where to go now, and that choice makes things a little more confusing, in a good way. In 2033 and Last Light, most encounters were indoors, and the stealth routes were often obvious. You stick to the sides and occasionally climb on things to get past guards sight unseen. Many of these stealth routes in the previous games were so obvious it was almost as if the guards wanted you to get to the end and kill their boss, like a form of work to rule protest. In Exodus, guard placement and movements are still done in such a way that there's always an optimal route, however it doesn't feel quite so obvious and scripted. Here you at least feel like the guards are trying. That said, I am a little disappointed in the lack of improvement in enemy AI. Exodus adds junk items to throw around, which should mean the stealth can be more challenging. The simple ability to manipulate guard movements means developers can put guards in places that block your route, and place the onus on the player to get the guard out of the way. No longer is stealth simply a case of waiting for a guard to turn their back so you can move to a new position. You have to force the guard to move. Except you don't. Outside of an early tutorial, there were only two occasions when I used junk to move enemies out of the way, and even then I'm not 100% sure it was necessary. Worst of all, the junk doesn't even work most of the time. Enemies often don't react to it, or they just look over and ignore it, or worst of all, they magically know where it came from and spot you instantly. Speaking of which, on Ranger Hardcore, enemies can spot you through solid walls at times. There's a level of inconsistency around all this that can be frustrating. One section had me trying to sneak onto a boat to row away, hopefully without being spotted. Sometimes nearby enemies heard me getting into the boat, and other times they didn't. I have no idea what I was doing differently, it just seemed random. I love these stealth sections, but I do wish they were harder. The Metro games have never been shooters to me, and avoiding combat has always been a core part of the experience. The more challenging this is, the more rewarding it becomes to accomplish, and as things stand, even on Ranger Hardcore, it isn't that tough. There are some cool moments though. At one point it looked like my only way forward was to break a lock which attracted a nearby guard. However, it turned out I could jump on a nearby boat swinging in the wind and use it to get around the door silently. I wish I had to do stuff like this more often. In some cases, the enemies even lead you down the correct path, such as this moment where it might be unclear where to go next, except a guard conveniently walks over to the right, hinting at the best way forward. The harder difficulty settings increase the punishment for getting caught, but they don't do much about how easy it is to avoid getting caught in the first place. This is something I'd love to see improve in future games. One thing that has improved from game to game is the storytelling. Unfortunately, for the purposes of videos like this one, none of the Metro stories are especially exciting when boiled down to a plot synopsis. They're very much stories where the enjoyment comes from the experience, not the excitement of various twists and turns or dramatic events. Metro 2033 was just Artia moving from station to station to warn Polis of the Dark One threat, before climbing a tower and guiding missiles to their destination. Last Light was an improvement. The rush to D6 for the all-important resources provided more impetus, and there was also the young Dark One which helped us explore Artyom's past and we ended up saving the species. 
Functionally, yes, Last Light was similar to 2033, but circumstances changed as the story progressed and RTM reacted to those changes. Exodus is probably the best Metro game story yet, although again you'd be forgiven for thinking otherwise from a brief description. The events sound tedious and even contrived at times, but the journey is still engaging thanks in no small part to the group of companions travelling with you. RTM having a bit of company makes a huge difference. The Developer Diary states that 4A Games wanted you to build relationships with your companions on board the train and yeah I absolutely did. There's Anya and Miller of course, plus the American Sam, Idiot who is anything but, Stepan, Demir, Duke and Alyosha. You also recruit a new engineer, Crest, and rescue Karcha and her daughter Nastya. The group is small enough that you have time to connect with all of them through the conversations you have between seasons. You also work with some of them in the field. Duke is a big part of Volga, Demir features heavily in the Caspian and Alyosha accompanies you to Tiger. Stepan ends up getting married to Katya and they make a great family. You can sit there and listen to Anya talk for ages, share a cigarette with Yermak or play a bit of guitar with Stepan. It's all a little reminiscent of Wolfenstein the New Colossus, except you're all living on top of each other so there's less time spent wandering around. Artyom still doesn't talk of course, so all these conversations are one-sided. Artyom's silence continues to baffle me. He talks in between levels, so he has a perfectly competent voice actor already lined up and there are a bunch of scenes that look absolutely absurd with a speechless Artyom. He doesn't say anything when Anya is captured or taken ill and he sits in on mission briefings without responding. This actively harms the storytelling and I can only assume that 4A Games worked itself into a bit of a corner with the silent protagonist thing and doesn't know how to resolve the issue now. Every conversation has to be structured around limiting the absurdity of having a silent protagonist. And while 4A Games does a decent job of damage mitigation, it's still not the preferred option. Maybe Artyom just chooses not to speak because he knows he won't be able to get a word in edgeways anyway. His companions talk a lot. Either the English voice acting has improved or I've just gotten used to it because the English dub rarely bothered me. There were a couple of moments where Karcher sounded English and a few poorly delivered lines, but I was fine with most of it. You can listen in Russian if you like, which I did for part of the second playthrough, however some of the background dialogue isn't subtitled, so you miss stuff this way. I know some people prefer the Russian for immersion, but it doesn't do it for me. I spend more time reading the bottom of the screen instead of looking around, and as for immersion, well, Artyom can speak Russian and understand those around him. I can't. Therefore having the dialogue in Russian actually takes me out of the moment more than puts me in it, because it makes me feel like a foreigner when I'm supposed to be a native. After escaping the Hansa and stealing the train at the start, Artyom and co are effectively fugitives. They can't return to Moscow because they'll be shot on sight. Miller suggests they look for the Russian government and let them know that Moscow has survived. They pick up a signal for the Ark, which is supposedly where the government gathered after the outbreak of the war, and they set off in that direction. First they have to spend a few hours in Volga, recruiting a new mechanic, getting a passenger train for the car, and figuring out a way to lower the bridge to continue on their journey. These missions perfectly illustrate why I love the Metro games. Missions that would be boring and feel like padding for time in other games only add to the sense of immersion in Artyom's world, and you can feel how thoroughly 4A Games has thought about every detail. So many games have stories where the major beats are crammed into the game without much thought. Think about most open world games. After a few missions the developers need an excuse to send the player to a new location, so you typically get a quick conversation with an NPC who tells you to go and find an item. It just so happens to be slightly further out of town than you've ventured so far. You then do a couple more missions and what do you know, you suddenly need to go to a new place. When done well there's nothing inherently wrong with this, but it is undeniable that the needs of the game push the story, rather than having them work in tandem. 4A Games lets the story lead the way most of the time, and when it doesn't it's disguised well enough that you often don't notice. Sure the missions you have to undertake in Volga and indeed the second open world area happen to make you explore most of the map and clearly this is no accident, but the important thing is that it feels natural. The story leads the way. 4A Games sat down and thought about what would happen if a group of soldiers stole a train and escaped without a plan. First up they'd probably need an engineer. The Order is a talented bunch but they are soldiers and there hasn't been much call for train drivers since the war broke out 20 years ago. Fortunately there's a talented former train driver nearby, so you go save him and he joins the crew. When you stole the train you only stole the engine. You're going to be in here a while so you could use some extra space. There's a nearby passenger carriage for you to steal which first requires you to grab a rail car because a passenger car isn't going to move of its own accord. As Prokhorov points out in a developer diary, a passenger car would be highly guarded and therefore sneaking in and stealing it is one of the toughest parts of the game. First you steal the rail car, drive it to the passenger carriage and then drag the passenger carriage back to the train. 
Many other games would have taken shortcuts here, such as having you clear the area of enemies and letting the train itself come in and grab the passenger carriage during a cutscene, or you wouldn't even have to do this mission in the first place. Instead it's a hell of a lot of work, and as such every time you walk around the train from here on out, you feel a sense of ownership of the passenger car that you wouldn't otherwise. You earn that extra space for your companions. The last thing you need to do in Volga is lower the bridge, but you don't have the resources to storm the huge complex. You first steal a trade caravan which you use to gain access to the facility, and eventually you get to flip the switch and lower the bridge. Even the enemies in Volga serve the story more than the game. The previous Metro games built up enemy factions like the 4th Reich, the Reds and Hansa. There must have been a temptation to use those groups again, and most games would. Look at how the Fallout games cram the same groups into each entry regardless of how well they fit the story or setting. The 4th Reich isn't quite as infamous as the Brotherhood of Steel, but it's certainly a group of comparable distinction in their respective franchises. However, the 4th Reich and the Reds wouldn't fit in with the story of Metro Exodus. Those factions blossomed in the metro stations themselves, and with the possible exception of a few Hansa members, they presumably wouldn't know about the outside world at all, let alone have the chance to expand outside there. Therefore, 4A Games opted to introduce entirely new enemy groups in every map. Volga is home to a fanatical religious group who don't believe in the use of electricity. They aren't really bad people as such, and if you meet them outside of their camps they will speak to you in a friendly enough manner, albeit they constantly refer to you as a heretic. This group, along with the cannibals you stumble along shortly after, are inspired by the extremist groups encountered in the Metro 2033 book. The 2033 game largely ignored these, so it's great to see them feature in Exodus. After leaving Volga you head to the Ark, with Miller believing it to be the home of the Russian government. Miller's a bit of an asshole towards Artyom at times, but you can't help but feel sorry for him when he realises he was tricked. Miller got all excited about getting a personal meeting with the Minister of Defence and breaking the big news that Moscow had survived the war, only to nearly get eaten instead when it turns out there is no government and the Ark is full of cannibals. After escaping the Ark, the train runs out of fuel and water, so they stop to regroup in a second large open area, the Caspian. With nowhere else to go, the group look for satellite maps that are supposedly in the area, hoping the maps will reveal a location free of radiation that they can call home. There's another group of fanatics to deal with here. The Baron rules like a dictator, with a small army and slaves who do his bidding. He gives regular speeches over the radio which you hear while driving around in a car that you steal early on. The main missions take you to the extreme ends of the map, but you pass a few slave camps along the way. It's up to you whether you stop and free the slaves. After leaving the Caspian, Anya gets sick and vomits up blood just after celebrating the marriage of Stepan and Katya. This moment had been long coming. Anna has had a nasty cough since she fell unconscious while looking for a weapon cache in Volga, and exposed herself to radiation without a mask. It probably didn't help matters that I had Artyom take a 24 hour rest when she was lying injured about 20 feet away. The crazy cannibal doctor from Yamantau told Anya that she likely had tuberculosis, but she kept this a secret from the group, not wanting to worry anyone. With no medicine available, the group decides the next best solution is to get Anya some fresh air, and so they head to Tiger. Tiger is absolutely stunning. This is the third major map, although this one isn't really open as such, it's just large with a couple of alternate routes you can take. The increased linearity let 4A games craft encounters a little more deliberately, and it shows with some beautiful set pieces and long sections sneaking past enemies. Tiger feels much closer to the spirit of the first couple of games. It's longer than any of those levels, but it retains the goal of trying to get from one end to the other as quietly as possible. Compare this to Volga and the Caspian where the missions were more like those of other open world games, where you go and get an item or find a new companion. You might recognise Tiger from the impressive trailer shown back in E3 2017, although the actual events were chopped and changed slightly. The section where Artyom escapes from an attack to burst out into the world is a merging of two separate scenes, and the fight with the Master of the Forest doesn't play out in the same space. While I find the misleading trailers to be annoying, I doubt there was anything particularly malicious behind this. The developer diaries state that Tiger was used as a test level for nearly every major feature in the game, such as crafting, enemy interactions, day-night cycles and dynamic weather conditions. Story events from other maps even took place here while they were a work in progress, so the dev team would have been incredibly comfortable with this map and it's easy to understand why they would create the big launch trailer here. Artyom and Alyosha head to Tiger to scout the place out, only to get separated due to an avalanche. Artyom is rescued by a woman called Olga who is part of a group called the Children of the Forest. The children follow the teachings of a man called The Teacher. This starts to sound like another cult group with a crazy leader, but there's actually a cool twist on it this time. The children of the forest were studying here when the war broke out. 
The teacher was their literal teacher and he or she taught them well. However, at some point after the outbreak of the war, the children split into two groups based on their interpretations of the teacher's teachings. The pioneers are the more peaceful group who want to live in harmony with nature and all that, whereas the pirates will kill outsiders on sight. Both groups intermingle and they don't appear to be actively at war with each other, it's more akin to a rivalry. This rivalry is distracting both sides from a much bigger problem and that's the dam which is about to burst and flood the entire area. Because of that there's no way the crew of the Aurora can settle down in Taiga and the clean air doesn't seem to have done much good for Anya anyway. She's on her last legs and the only hope now is an experimental medicine that might be located in the dead city. The dead city has higher radiation levels than anywhere in the country and is appropriately intimidating. Venturing outside here feels like that first time you went out in Metro 2033, when you wandered around not knowing whether to be more scared of the mutated beasts or the air itself. Miller and Artyom head into the city and eventually go underground into a metro system, much like the one in Moscow. People survived down here for years despite the radiation on the surface, however a massive battle wiped everyone out in the last year. Dead bodies are everywhere, piled up around doors where armies made their final stand. This war was fought over resources in a similar way to the fight over D6 in Metro Last Light. In the case of the dead city, the resource in question is green stuff, that's what they call it, which is an anti-radiation medicine. Supplies of green stuff ran low and the inevitable war broke out, killing everyone except for a young boy called Kirill, whose father left to look for more green stuff but never came back. Artyom and Miller split up, with Artyom going after the medication for Anya and Miller looking for some more maps that will hopefully reveal a radiation-free zone they can all go and live in. Artyom gets the medicine but has to be rescued by Miller. Miller gives Artyom the last dose of the green stuff and in the process sacrifices his own life. Miller is buried in a scenic location overlooking the water. Artyom's fate once again depends on whether you get the good ending or the bad ending and is essentially the only difference between the two. I can safely say that the good ending is canon this time, unlike in Metro 2033 where the bad ending was canon. If you get the bad ending there's a nice scene where you reunite with friends you lost along the way plus Khan who is able to communicate with the afterlife. Overall I didn't find the story especially exciting, but I'd argue it's not supposed to be. Metro games aren't emotional roller coasters. they're long slogs through the mud in a world where a good day for Artyom would be everyone else's worst nightmare. Artyom faces a constant struggle to survive and events that might feel underwhelming in other games are significant moments here due to the series focus on realism and immersion. If another game asked me to go and explore a bunker to find a map, I'd treat it like the chore it undeniably is and go about my job. In Metro Exodus, finding a map that might reveal somewhere you can actually live free of bandits, mutants and radiation is a huge victory. My favourite part is how 4A games dealt with the good slash bad ending split. It's one of the most impressive implementations I've seen in a game with a binary set of good and bad choices, and it comes to a logical and fair conclusion. Before getting into that though, I want to discuss a few parts of the story I didn't like. I kind of hinted at this earlier when discussing the open worlds, but I do believe the two larger maps hurt the pacing a touch, especially when compared to Tiger, which is an excellent level by comparison. My main playthrough came in 18 hours, although you can probably knock a couple of hours off if you play on an easier mode or just don't die as often as I did. That's a big step up from the 8 to 10 hour runtimes of the first two games. A longer story doesn't have to mean a worse story, of course, but much of the extra time here comes from exploring open spaces, and that doesn't really add much. Side quests get you some decent items but rarely have their own stories or flesh out the main story, and a fair chunk of your time is just moving from one part of the map to the other. The lack of constant distractions is welcome compared to cookie cutter open world games, however if there isn't going to be anything interesting to see, do you really need it to be an open world at all? The Volga map is the slowest and comes as a brutal change of pace after the rapid opening which has you kidnapped, stealing a train and blowing another one up all in the space of an hour or so. If you haven't read Metro 2035, all the information about Hansa maintaining signal jammers and working with the invisible watchers comes at you incredibly quickly. You're barely able to keep on top of events, let alone understand why Miller would ever have been okay with this. Hansa kill anyone who uncovers the secret about Moscow, which is either those within the Metro who try to leave or those from outside who attempt to enter. Given that those in the Metro think the entire world is empty, it's usually the latter who are caught and executed. One of the diary entries attempts to justify this by showing how paranoid Hansa are about enemy spies, even suspecting old women and children as being sent to sabotage jammers on behalf of NATO, hence the executions of the old woman and the child at the beginning. It's pretty crazy stuff. The Invisible Watchers kept Moscow hidden because they wanted to control the Metro. If everyone lived in fear of the war, the Invisible Watchers could live lives of luxury while running the show. 
They picked the leaders of the four factions and even manipulated the wars amongst them to ensure the population didn't grow too large. This is where things get a little weird because we have to consider the possibility that the Invisible Watchers actually acted in everyone's best interests, whether deliberately or not. People are surviving in the Metro. Life isn't good and resources are slim which leads to regular faction wars, however people are still alive. They have just enough to get by. Compare that to the situation in the Dead City, where everyone fought to the death over resources and the only survivor was a child. Is it possible that by enforcing population control the Invisible Watchers ensure the survival of the people in the Metro? The interesting point this raises for me is that isn't this quite similar to the Mass Effect 3 ending? The eventual death of all humanity is inevitable unless we accept widespread losses in the present day to maintain a stable population. Kill now to save later. If left alone the metro population will grow and that will lead to a shortage of resources and every metro system will end up like the one in the dead city. Whether they meant to or not, the invisible watchers ensured that never happened by limiting population growth in the first place so things never became quite that desperate. I know it feels like a stretch. At first I thought I was only making the comparison because I played Mass Effect 3 recently and it was stuck in my head, but then I noticed something else. The ending is a fake out. Artyom hallucinated everything from the moment he fell unconscious in the Dead City due to mind control from the Dark Ones. I call this the indoctrination theory, bear with me on this one. First of all we need to remember that the Dark Ones have a connection to Artyom and in previous games Artyom also saw haunting images of ghostly figures and weird electrical anomalies. Artyom starts experiencing both of those things again in the Dead City so the Dark Ones must be around. Plus the shadows are dark and the Dark Ones are called the Dark Ones. What more do you need? And then there's the kid. Don't you think it's weird that only Artyom can see him? I mean Miller never acknowledges the kid in any way. Plus the child just disappears right in front of your eyes and it's impossible to know where he could have gone. Well the kid isn't real. He's a hallucination prepared by the Dark Ones for reasons. We don't need to worry about what those reasons might be, just accept them. However the best evidence is still to come. The ending conclusively proves once and for all that the indoctrination theory is correct and that the entire ending is a fake out. Just wait till you see all the evidence I have to support this theory, it's going to blow your mind. Unfortunately I don't have time to include it in this video because they always need to be shorter than an arbitrary number that I've just made up, so you'll just have to wait for a future video. Don't worry though, it's coming and your mind will be blown. I'm so glad the indoctrination theory is 100% a fact because otherwise the lack of the Dark Ones would be a touch disappointing. They were a major part of the first two games although only one of the three books, which is perhaps why they aren't included here. I love all the weird supernatural stuff and handled well there's no reason why they can't lean into it a little more without harming the immersion or realism or whatever you want to call it. Exodus does have some weird stuff like the electrical anomalies in Volga and the floating stuff in the Dead City when Artyom starts to have visions, but nothing much is done with it. As a really minor aside I was kind of disappointed that Artyom didn't have a child in this game. In the bad ending to Last Light we see that Anya got pregnant after her little liaison with Artyom in quarantine. We weren't specifically shown this in the good ending but he still had sex with Anya in quarantine and therefore presumably Anya would still be pregnant. Mind you, given a choice I'm glad Anya didn't spend the entirety of Exodus looking after a kid because she's an important part of the crew. Nothing I've described is a major story problem. The absence of the Dark Ones and the slightly slower pace mean I don't look back on Exodus's story quite as favourably as Last Light, but it's good enough to serve what 4A Games was going for, namely a high level of immersion, detail and to an extent realism. The story may not generate loads of discussion or thought after playing, but that doesn't mean Exodus isn't a thoroughly enjoyable experience, even on a second playthrough. That second playthrough was required in my case because I got the bad ending on my first run, and I wasn't entirely sure why. By the standards of binary good and bad endings, the distinction here is a really believable one. At the end, after being saved by the crew of the Aurora, Artyom gets the medicine to Anya who makes a full recovery. However, Artyom's own life still hangs in the balance due to all the radiation he exposed himself to. The crew of the Aurora all line up to donate their blood for the cause, however there might not be enough blood and that's where your previous actions come in. There are three crewmates who might not be around to donate blood at the end depending on your choices in earlier levels. On my first run I only had one of the three and that wasn't enough. On the second run I had all three and that obviously was. According to what I've seen online you need at least two of the three people to be there for the blood donation drive. To keep Duke around till the end you need to have him survive the assault on the bridge in Volga. For Demir you need to help the slaves enough that he doesn't feel the need to stay behind and help Gil with the work. And Alyosha gets shot if you annoy Olga by killing the pirates and Tiger. At a high level the whole blood transfusion thing is a great idea. Needing your companions around to donate blood is a far more logical reward for your previous actions than the shenanigans at the end of Mass Effect 2, where your companion relationships play out in some utterly bizarre ways that make no real sense. 
I also love how neatly this ties up with the beginning of the game, when you needed a blood transfusion and the doctor tells you there might not be enough blood next time. It's a lovely little bit of foreshadowing. As with the previous games, your ending is determined by the morality point system and how many good points you got versus bad ones or just none at all. At least I think this is how it works. It'll take a lot of testing to nail down the details and given that people still debate exactly how it works in Metro 2033 and Last Light, it might take quite a while before we know for sure. The game strongly suggests that your success is determined based on your actions at very specific moments. In Volga, you're not so subtly told that you should try to avoid direct combat when attacking the church, because Duke is less experienced than you and could pick up bad habits from your approach. Therefore, if you were to go in all guns blazing, it makes sense that Duke would die in the process. Except I did mess this area up and had to kill a few traders. That would suggest imminent failure, however, Duke survived, and I suspect this was because I earned enough morality points elsewhere by completing actions like freeing a prisoner and finding Nastia's teddy bear. In the next area, you're told to avoid killing the slaves because they are innocent. Gil practically nudges and winks as she tells you this. I was careful not to kill any slaves and even took a bunch of damage running through an area without attacking because I was so determined to leave them be. I still failed. At the end of the mission, Demir said he was going to stay behind with Gil to help his people. On the second playthrough, I realised I missed a bunch of morality points because I didn't stop at the labour camps to free the slaves. So, given those experiences, it seems like you need a certain balance of morality points at the end of the last mission on a map to trigger the good resolution to the questline, which eventually leads to the good ending. The third situation in Tiger is a little less clear. When you first start this level, you're given a nice new weapon, the crossbow, and introduced to the pirate half of the Children of the Forest, which sure as hell suggests you are allowed to treat them like normal enemies, and yep, sure enough, if they spot you, they will try to kill you. I don't believe you're punished with a negative morality point if you do kill them, however you miss out on the good morality point you would get from leaving them be. Now, with the pioneers, not only do you lose out on a good morality point by killing them, you get a bad morality point if you kill them before they've engaged you in combat. So taking them out with a quiet headshot is no longer an option. Oh, and there are also bandits. You're allowed to kill bandits, except there's a bandit who got tied up and left for dead by the children of the forest, and if you save him, you get a good morality point. Bear in mind that these three groups do look largely interchangeable, and these rules aren't spelled out to you, so I had to spend some time experimenting. It's also annoying that you're given such a great stealth weapon near the end and then told not to use it. On top of all this, it appears that the rules change near the end when Olga specifically tells you not to kill anyone, even the pirates, and even if they shoot at you, because they're only misguided children, although they look like adults with guns to me. On my main playthrough, I killed two pirates because they were guarding a boat, and it annoyed me that sometimes they would spot me rowing away on the boat and sometimes they wouldn't. The rest of the level, I ignored everyone else. I don't know whether it was killing those two pirates specifically, or just a lack of good actions elsewhere on the map, but on that first playthrough, Olga and a couple of our mates came by and shot Alyosha as we were escaping on a zipline. If you keep your hands clean, then Olga and Alyosha have a tender goodbye, and he tells them to leave the area before the dam collapses. If you do this, you hear later on that they do indeed leave the area in time. My experience in Tiger suggests that the last mission is all important when determining how that map ends, however it's all so unclear that I can't say for sure. Perhaps I accidentally killed some pioneers who I thought were bandits. It's nothing to lose sleep over. Your ending won't carry over into any future games and you can easily see the ending you missed on YouTube. I still wouldn't mind a little more clarity though. Make it obvious who we can and can't kill at least. On the non-ranger hardcore modes you have crosshairs and they will be yellow when you move them over enemies you're not supposed to kill. Speaking of difficulty modes, they are largely excellent this time around and there's a lot more clarity. As a quick reminder, in the Redux versions of Metro 2033 and Metro Last Light, you could choose to play in either Spartan or Survival mode, with Spartan being a little heavier on the shooting than Survival, and then within those modes you could play on either Normal, Hardcore, Ranger or Ranger Hardcore. That's a total of 8 options and they were a mess. Choosing between, say, Normal and Hardcore or Ranger and Ranger Hardcore was a typical choice of challenge, however, deciding whether to play Survival or Spartan, or one of the Ranger modes versus one of the Normal modes, was a lot tougher and required you to commit to multiple playthroughs without knowing whether you were happy with your decision. Then there was the situation with the HUD. I wanted to recommend everyone play on one of the Ranger modes because I believe that was the best experience. However, Ranger mode didn't have many of the HUD options, so you wouldn't know what you could and couldn't interact with. For newcomers, this could be quite frustrating. I ended up recommending players spend a few hours in the normal modes before then restarting and playing in a ranger mode. This is obviously not ideal. Metro Exodus is a huge improvement, mainly because there's no need for the two different playstyle options and the five difficulties are easier to understand. There's a narrative option called Reader for those who just want the story and a typical easy mode. Both of these really do lack anything in the way of challenge. 
You can clear out camps just by running up to all the enemies and knocking them out. You regain health so quickly that any damage you take can be easily ignored. I don't recommend these modes for most players, although of course feel free to use them if you need to. If you've not played any Metro games before, then start on Normal or Hardcore. Normal provides just about enough challenge to keep a new player on their toes, and Hardcore is quite tough. Whichever one of these difficulties you pick, you'll be able to select from a variety of HUD options such as turning the crosshairs off, changing the difficulty on the fly, and making quick saves. If you've played the previous Metro games, then I highly recommend Ranger Hardcore mode. As with those previous games, Ranger mode really is where it's at. Ranger Hardcore mode keeps the HUD to an absolute minimum, and even gives you the option to turn it off entirely. I absolutely don't recommend you do the latter. The minimal HUD is more than sufficient to maintain immersion while giving you just about enough information. Turning the HUD off entirely could cause some major headaches, and I wouldn't recommend it until a second or even third playthrough. To give examples of problem areas, during a couple of conversations or when looking at the map on the train, you don't progress by pressing any one of the normal interact buttons. Instead, you must hold down A or D on the keyboard and probably use the D-pad on a controller. This is completely unintuitive and given that you need to hold the button and not tap it, you could be here for a very long time. Then there are the random crawl spaces that RTM can move through. I struggled to spot a couple of these even with the prompts that would come up on screen when I got close. They are easy to miss and again require you to hold a button down. Without any HUD at all, you could find yourself going up to every tiny gap and trying to crawl through it. That's not even considering the lack of information you get on ammo or what special equipment you have on you. The light HUD mode is nearly perfect, although I'd still like to see what ammo I'm picking up as well. Ideally this light HUD would be an option in all difficulties, I don't see why it's restricted to the Ranger Hardcore mode because it isn't strictly a difficulty thing. As for the actual difficulty in Ranger Hardcore mode, it is both challenging and also a touch easier than I expected in certain places. If I'd played through Exodus on normal mode first, I would have identified a long list of encounters that I would be dreading in a Ranger Hardcore run. However, for the most part those battles weren't that hard. For those who aren't aware, Ranger Hardcore isn't your typical hard difficulty setting where you take a lot less damage and enemies take a lot more. In Ranger Hardcore, you will go down in one hit or two if you're lucky, however so will most enemies. This leads to some incredibly spectacular and tense shootouts with you hiding behind cover and knowing that every time you pop out, there's a very real chance you'll be on the receiving end of a headshot. Hell, you don't even really need to be out in the open. In one section I was hiding behind a car, or at least I thought I was hiding, only to discover the hard way that my head was visible through a window and that was all their guy needed to pick me off. I cannot deny that this did lead to some frustrating moments, but the good outweighed the bad and these sorts of deaths are usually your own fault, so it's a learning process. The Metro games are one of the few series that punishes you for taking even a single hit, and even when in cover you never feel truly safe. There's the odd bullet that seems to go through solid rock, but I'll take that in exchange for the exhilarating moments where you scrape through gunfights by the skin of your teeth. 4A Games has stated that the enemy AI is more advanced on the Ranger Hardcore setting, and I agree that they certainly put up more of a challenge even if I don't necessarily think calling it higher artificial intelligence is apt. Enemies are more aggressive, but they use the same tactics as in other settings, with flanking being the main one and they're a little more grenade happy as well. Enemies are also quick to react, although again I wouldn't call this artificial intelligence. It's certainly artificial though. If you take an enemy out or throw a grenade, every single enemy suddenly knows where you are. As you'd expect, this is incredibly sensitive on Ranger Hardcore. Make any kind of noise or give away your location to anyone and the reaction from the entire group is instant. This is all to be expected on the highest difficulty setting, I just think it's a bit of a stretch to refer to it as improved AI. Full scale shootouts are generally limited to the bandit camps and side quests dotted around the world. With the major enemy encounters on the main questline, you want to take the stealth route through to the end because there are far too many enemies to take on by yourself. There are a couple of set piece moments that put you in shootouts, such as the one I mentioned earlier where you're ambushed out in the desert or one where you have to defeat two waves of enemies while Gil gets a door unlocked. The desert set piece was fun because it was in the middle of a chaotic storm and it was satisfying to pop out and take a quick shot, but I didn't enjoy this more contained moment where you have nowhere to run or hide. This took me a lot of attempts to get past and I only did it by memorising where all the enemies came from and where they would go. The one challenge type I didn't enjoy were the encounters with beasts, particularly the shrimp with their projectile attacks. Here's the thing with the shrimp, you're most likely going to get attacked by them when you're on the boat because they hang out in the water or just on the shore. The boat moves incredibly slowly. Artyom can't look behind him or move in the boat at all. If you spot a shrimp then all you can do is wait for the projectile to hit you. There were a couple of boat trips I had to replay multiple times until through sheer luck I managed to get a run where I only got hit by one projectile. This is the type of challenge I don't enjoy, although I'm sure someone will tell me I missed an easy solution. 
Other beasts can be a pain as well, leading to a few deaths seemingly out of nowhere. I assume one of the Watchmen came up and bit me on the ass here, but I don't know for sure. At least the rules are relatively clear when fighting human enemies. You can take two body shots or one headshot. It's tough, but at least you know what you're up against. I have no idea how much damage I can take from the various beasts. Sometimes they bite me multiple times for little damage, and other times they kill in one hit. Given these issues, I'm a little surprised at how easy some of the major beast fights were in Ranger Hardcore mode. The fight against the large bear known as the Master of the Forest was appropriately intimidating and I'd been dreading fighting him in Ranger Hardcore mode ever since seeing that E3 trailer. I struggled with these types of boss fights in the previous two games and didn't fancy my chances here, even less so having been taken out by the measly shrimp so many times. And yet he goes down fairly easily both times you fight him. You need to be prepared with fire based weapons but the game makes that fairly obvious and gives you the chances to stock up before fights. You should know what's coming and if you do you just have to avoid his well telegraphed charges. By the way I love how he will run straight through buildings if you're hiding behind one. I thought hiding would be an easy way to avoid getting hit but it certainly wasn't. There's also a brilliant late game enemy called the blind ones. These gorilla-esque creatures reminded me of the librarians who you could avoid conflict with by maintaining eye contact. That's not possible here because these guys don't have eyes. They see by smell and sound so if you keep quiet and maintain a decent distance you'll be okay. That's easier said than done in some of these locations however and eventually I got cornered after not flipping all the switches to open a door. The blind ones have some sort of telepathic ability so they taunt Artyom and ended up reminding me of Grodd from The Flash. They went down relatively easily for such big guys just needing a couple of molotovs and a few explosive pellets to the head. They took a lot more damage when I played on normal which just shows that it's not only human enemies that go down easier on ranger hardcore mode. These battles felt infinitely better than comparable ones in 2033 and Last Light some of which had me replaying boss fights so many times I genuinely thought I might not be able to make any more progress. If you still need more of a challenge you can take a stab at the New Game Plus mode 4A games added recently. As New Game Plus modes go it's a really good one because you can customise it to get the experience you want. You can pick up to 3 modifiers which can make the game easier, harder or just different. For the particularly sadistic among you there's an Iron Man mode with permadeath or you can increase the amount of armour enemies wear or you can carry forward all the weapons you unlocked in your previous playthrough to make life a little easier. You can also listen to developer diaries scattered throughout the levels. My favourite mods were making the extreme weather conditions more common and increasing the amount of radiation hotspots because they're rather infrequent in your first playthrough. It's a great mode and I like the flexibility offered. Those weather conditions really do look incredible as does pretty much everything in the game barring the odd bug and a few weird character animations. The attention to detail 4A games put into the Metro series is absolutely outstanding and one of the reasons I love this series and will continue to be excited by anything the developer puts out. The little details add up from the beginning to the end. When you stumble upon a crashed plane you can see the electrical wires it got caught up in when it crash landed at the outbreak of the war. There are cave paintings in some of the underground regions and the anti-electricity group uses small flames on the end of their helmets as flashlights and the face of the Baron forms part of his mountain hideout. I also love the way the last couple of enemies usually surrender once you've killed all their friends. This is such an obvious and yet impactful thing I'm amazed more games don't do it. You lose a moral point if you kill them after they've surrendered so just knock them out instead. Those aren't pointless little details only there for environmental storytelling. They all serve to keep you in the world and build on themselves when required. Take the last level for example. We're told that radiation levels are especially high in the dead city. It's one of the worst hit areas in Russia. You need to get in and get out as quickly as possible. Most games would have left it there but not a metro game. If the radiation is especially dangerous that means something and in this case it means you need to put on heavy gear which you can hear as Miller walks around the train. The car you go out in has also been modified with an extra layer of lead. I know it's a small thing but when you're preparing to go out on a mission and you look around to see the whole crew wearing extra layers of lead you feel an appropriate level of intimidation for whatever awaits you out there. If you were to strip all this away the final level would just be another trip into an irradiated zone much like the ones you took outside in the first two games. However 4A games made it feel like much more than that adding a sense of urgency and risk to your task. This extra urgency builds up throughout the game due to the increasingly linear levels which means every major map goes by quicker than the one before it. Volga is a decent sized open world map that you'll probably spend more time on than any other. The Caspian is another large map however you have a car to get around in so it flies by a bit quicker. Tiger is a far less open map where you generally move in one direction and finally there's the Dead City which is as linear as levels in the previous games. 
Regardless of how you feel about the open world levels versus the more linear ones, the decision to increase the sense of urgency and intensity as the game progressed was definitely a sensible one. Despite leaving the confines of the Metro system and shifting to larger and more open levels, Metro Exodus stays faithful to the spirit of the two previous games in most major ways, which means it offers another incredibly immersive experience that puts you right in the Russian post-nuclear apocalypse and prioritises a slow journey over an exciting adventure. If you didn't like Metro 2033 and Last Light, especially the Redux versions which smoothed over some of the rough edges, then the slightly larger levels aren't going to change anything for you, the core idea is much the same. I should wrap up this analysis with some catchy lines that summarise my feelings about the game, but that is so difficult here. Even after two playthroughs and 16,000 words, I still don't know exactly how I feel about the experience. Weirdly, giving Exodus a score out of 5 is the easy part here, when that's usually what I struggle with. It's clearly a 4 star game. There's no way my criticisms bring this down to 3 stars, and I didn't experience the consistent highs that I expect from a 5 star game. Everything else is harder to pin down. The worlds aren't bad, however they don't add much either, at least not in their current form. The mission design does a decent job taking advantage of the large spaces, and yet there's still far too much dead space and nothing interesting was done with the beasts, beyond just dumping them into certain areas. Bandit camps are rather underwhelming as well, but at least they aren't all over the place. Ultimately Exodus would be a better game if the Volga and Caspian stages were a little more like Tiger, however that doesn't mean those areas are a complete waste of time. Getting the rail car out of a warehouse full of mutants, driving it over to the passenger carriage, clearing that area of enemies and then pulling the passenger carriage over to the train was one of the most satisfying missions in the series, and in the Caspian I love stopping and freeing the slaves. That sounds like typical open world filler content, but because 4A Games has done such an excellent job building the Metro world, it feels like much more than that. Each encounter has meaning with decent equipment that you can't get elsewhere, and freeing groups of slaves can be a huge drain on resources where your only reward is a moral point. Yes, it can look a bit black and white on the face of it, but there's a reason I didn't get enough moral points in my first playthrough. Being good involves risk, and I didn't want to always take those risks. I wish I loved Exodus a little more. That's a silly thing to say I guess, I and mean, I wish I loved every game more to a certain extent, but 4A Games was really building to something here. Last Light was an improvement over 2033, which was already a good game, and Exodus looked like it would be another clear leap forward. It ended up being more of a step to the side. Exodus is damn good, but it isn't the undeniable high point in the trilogy that I hoped it would be. Okay, thank you very much for watching all the way through to the end. The next major video will be on Baldur's Gate 2 as part of my retrospective series on the history of isometric CRPGs. After that, well, I have a game in mind. It's the first in a trilogy from a European developer and has been highly requested on this channel ever since I started. Make sure you subscribe to see that content and preferably hit the notification icon as well. I'd also love it if you could click the like button and share the video on popular online places that you likely know better than I do. My videos haven't been doing too well lately which could just be a quality issue but I'd love it if they could gain a little more traction. Finally, the very generous amongst you can join my Patreon where you get your name in the credits and a Patreon role in my Discord server for just $1 a month. There are no tiers or other rewards because I don't want to restrict content to those who can afford it. Alright everyone, until next time, cheers.